an A to Z history version because with me is Kate the Disney Cicero. We decided the best way to do this is uh, Kate will share some fun facts and then I'll share some fun facts about each attraction and then go to the next one. Yeah. So the Astro Orbiter was it originally the Astro Orbiter was the Star Jet. I opened in 1974, so it wasn't the opening day attraction. The really interesting thing about this is these type of rides, um, when they were originally made, they used they used fuel tanks that were left over from World War II that they hollowed out of the side. So that's where we get the shape of these from. Also, they're like rocket shape, right? But they're from uh, the World War II, like new carriages that only other made the And that's originally got Averages a rotation of 11 per minute, which makes roughly 1.2 million rotations a year. Shout out to KG Almeo Bellin. All right, second ride B for Buzz Lightyear. Star Command, come in Star Command. Hit this robot, hit that claw, hit the volcano, hit underneath Zerg, your Galactic Hero. Just like that, let's take that, Zerg. Galactic Hero. I see a struct of all you use it to say, it's just a struct of all the sounds at 294. So this is Buzz Lightyear, and this actually, in Disneyland and in Disney World, was something else before it was this. And in this one in particular was originally in You Had Wings. And then it eventually became Delta Dream Flight, and then um, it closed in 1998. This original sign back here was the Delta Dream Flight sign. They just painted over it. So, yeah, I mean, there it is. Painted over. There's the photo. And you go on the people mover, and you go past those large windows and bigger look. They used to be like holiday friends, like Mexico and Jamaica and Trinidad. And it was an older thing, and there was actually there was a song, there was several songs that went through within the history. C would be for the country bears. We're gonna talk about this guy in just a second. Oh, like that is Big Al, which we all know. Very popular bear. But he was actually after an animator named Al Bertino, and that's why he's named Big Al. And he actually was made to look a little bit like Al Bertino, if you could believe that. Yeah, like a lot. His song isn't an original song. Most people don't know that. That wasn't like written for this show. Which song? Blood on the Saddle. Oh, no. No, it was like a popular cowboy tune. And like a and then Davy Crockett as well was a very popular one, which was from the very first Disneyland TV show, was when they premiered Davy Crockett starring uh, Cass Parker. And that became a huge phenomenon. D for Dumbo. It was an opening day attraction over at Disneyland, but it didn't work. So they literally had this weird looking elephant walking around pretending that things were moving. Nothing was moving. Also, talking about unhinged, the ears, had hinges did they ever work they so what happened with the ears is they did work but because the weight of the hinges actually made it so the elephant couldn't lift but it made it almost 200 pounds heavier than they had planned so what happened was the hydraulics were not able to lift the elephants up of the ear properly and they created what was this like foam with the hydraulic fluid created this comb that if they didn't skim it off it would, it would completely fail. So between every ride, every launch and every ride, it had somebody go over and skim all the foam off of all the hydraulic pieces within it. And they called it milking the elephant. Uh -huh. That was the only way they got it to work. Eventually Disneyland has uh, Timothy Q Mouse is on top of the version of Disneyland, but he is not here. He is only up here on their side. So this area used to be very, very different. While we had a lot of carpets here, this was actually the entire Sunshine Pavilion. We had a waterfall and a whole area where uh, that you could sit near that had water, a tropical thing, kind of like the Polynesian. But another feature of this is there was an audio loop that had music on this area, and there was a Parker bird, or a bird that would try to draw you into the attraction. They were sitting up in the rafters. And uh, he's a... Long gone, unfortunately. 
a lot of Imagineers take inspiration and including Walt Disney himself for his Enchanted Tea Guru got the idea for audio animatronics in his travels when he found this mechanical clicking bird basically brought back and they reverse engineered it and created the very first audio animatronics which are run on tape in a gigantic computer like think Whopper from uh, Matthew Broderick or games gigantic computer that's housed underneath his facility welcome to f with the frontier shooting arcade which by the way is free but it used to cost money like 25 shots for a dollar uh and this was an opening day attraction and it actually uses authentic 54 caliber hawkins buffalo rifles to hit all the different light activated uh structures or infrared now i believe but originally it was light which is awesome the targets were originally your well, the targets, but the things that we shoot lead pellets at everything, and that had to be repainted almost every night because the lead pellets would chip away at the heat. So much so that they used 2,000 gallons of wood per year to repaint it, and it was obviously very labor intensive. So they, in 1982, they swapped out the lead pellets for uh, infrared technology, which also was a little bit safer, as you can imagine. Damn. All right, let's let's see it, Tex. Let's see what you got. <laughs> okay. Uh, bird. <laughs> All right, yeah. Which bird are you going for? Right, left, side, <laughs> owl center tree, <laughs> drain, or Conestoga wagons. It's a tough one. All right. <laughs> Just fast. It was it was quick. How about the hotel? Another tough one. All the way in that distance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that is bad. Text. You got this. Nice job. Yeah. Welcome to P for P. Is it P for pirates? No. It's Grandmaster. G. We're going to talk about chess in a second. Ignore the whole P thing. Uh, but here's here's a fun fact on uh, Pirates of the Caribbean is this outside structure is made to be a combination of both a fort that is in both Cuba as well as Puerto Rico. And over here, the Castillo del uh, Moro means the castle or fortress on the hill. One of my favorite things about Walt Disney World version of this attraction for Pirates of the Caribbean is this queue that Harm Davis designed. And he put something in it that was actually an idea that he had for a very long time. And it showed up in the plans for a haunted mansion. We used to straight some three sketches trying to figure out what he wanted to make the ghosts do. And he had two ghosts that were sitting at a chessboard playing chess. Well, that didn't actually end up in the haunted mansion, but it did end up here in the Florida version of Pirates of the Caribbean. And we see these two pirates that are locked in an eternal game of chess that nobody can ever win. And at um, one point, they had to refurb this part of the attraction and they took everything down and were fixing it. And then they realized, oh my goodness, we don't know how to set that back up because it was actually from a chess master but taught them how to do the eternal game of chess. But Mark Davis, being he was, he had actually put instructions on how to reset the board on the back side, and so they were able to reset it as it was supposed to be. Tell me how cool it would be to flip over that board. It would be totally. <laughs> no, dude, that's all I think about. But I would like to. I would like to flip over. <laughs> At the top, there's another Mark Davis and chess reference. Up there, you notice that it says it's so hard for me to record. It's it's Mark Davis though, which is like a fake. Uh, shield and crest. What if you notice the base is up there? That is a knight at the top. So again, another reference to Jess and his attraction. Uh, the, uh, I mean, can anything else be letter H than the mansion? Considering the fact that we've done for history a 27 part d diatribe on how amazing this attraction is and how well themed and detail, we can tell you everything. And we will tell you some, but honestly, the best way, just go check out Disney Cicerone or go look at Distry because we will go in so much detail. People love listening to it in the car too. Just, uh, you'll be able to geek out with us. Look up Distry.
We weren't originally supposed to have the ghost host that we currently have. In fact, we were supposed to have Beauregard, which was this awesome butler, and this was going to be a walkthrough attraction. But also in the concept art was supposed to potentially be a raven. And in fact, you can see set raven. And there's so many uh, Edgar Allan Poe references that happen within this attraction. Throughout the attraction, it's about like six or seven times, you physically see our disenchanted feathery friends. But when you want to see our actual ghost host who does not have physically a name that's identified in canon, uh, we get to see him, one, hanging in the stretching room, two, in the uh, loading platform, all the way on the right-hand side next to some of the other Sinister Eleven is the Hatchet Man. Later on, we see him playing the piano. That is his uh, shadow. And then lastly would be the final uh, portrait in, it's basically the door knocker hallway. There's a Hatchet Man portrait in there as well. So this haunted mansion didn't always look like this. In the original concept art, it was going to be a federal style building and it had identical sides that were going to have identical stretching rooms on either side. Now, everybody says there's a high water table here in Florida, and that is why they put the stretching room go up instead of down like in uh, California, where it goes down in an elevator and then goes through a tunnel in Disneyland. But that's not actually true. This was planned to have two elevators in this building back when it was a federal style <laughs> building. And even here, it does have uh, two sides with two, two rooms for elevators. So what happened here was they, um, in Disneyland in the early 70s, they had a leak in the rivers of America that leaked and seeped into the elevator shafts and caused the elevators to fail, which are uh, piston-based hydraulic elevators in Disneyland's Haunted Mansion. So what they did was they realized that could happen here because it's right next to the rivers of America. So they pivoted their idea, but they'd already ordered the, ordered the Otis elevators I remember for this attraction. So instead of putting the elevators in the mansion, they redesigned it into this style here. And so we do see two sides for the stretching rooms, which now lift up instead of going down. And they repurposed the elevators. One is in uh, West Sunny Eclipse over in Tomorrowland, and the other one was in Fantasyland, but is now extinct, doesn't exist anymore. But they're the exact same shape as the stretching rooms and size. And um, Sunny Eclipse actually goes up into the ceiling, and and there's a fan stand. So uh, it's, it's, the the myth is always that we don't have elevators here because of the high water table. But you have to remember. But the utilidors are built up 16 feet. So we are actually quite above the water table here. I, it's a small world after all. Feature on It's a Small World. It was originally going to be there. It was the Tower of Four Winds during the 1964 movie. It was only a profit, and it was a huge moving sculpture that used all my tour colors and moving uh, metal. But the thing was that when they made that, um, Raleigh Croft designed it in a specific way, specific dimensions, so when the engineers got involved, they decided they needed to thing it up a little bit. So I think that was six inches, they made like 16 inches. And so by the time it was finished, it was like big and bulky and not at all what Raleigh Croft had designed. And he hated it, he absolutely hated it. And while they convinced him that it was okay. It looked great. It was fine. But as a designer, like as the artist, he really needed it. I so that design actually did move back to Disneyland with it. They needed something new because it was too expensive to move. So they designed for his clock, based Walt Disney said, let's do a clock. Raleigh Crump designed this one. Then in Disneyland's version, it has a doll marine that comes out every, every 15 minutes. And the first doll is actually represented in England, which is where they have credit speed time. For these soldiers, they went, no, you can't do that because if you make them lots of blue, that means you don't acknowledge that the British beat uh, Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza fighting imaginary giants, which are these windmills. So in Venice, this little canal boat in Italy, the top is for uh, the religious leadership, the doji. So that's the doji's cap and those little comb fingers on the top of that boat. Uh, were for the different tributaries and different training sectors of Venice. J is for Jungle Cruise, and the Jungle Cruise is apparently closed after hours, but we've been doing a long history for it. There's so many things we could talk about, like, for example, these guys used to be down those guys. 
The talking logs, not so loggy, not so talky now, more like spitty. It's also, I just like showing off one of my favorite hidden Mickeys is the one right up here underneath the J. It's just a cute one with the barnacles. In the Jungle Cruise has a whole bunch of connections to the film Casablanca. The main Imagineer on this project that developed the Jungle Cruise was Harper Gott. Like, he was also a set designer for the movie Casablanca. But that's why we get um, the Euro Casablanca like stone that has a little mural on it in the queue. But also we have the plane that is in here that was used in the great movie ride. The front half was used in the, the great movie ride and the back half ended up here in the Casablanca scene. Now there are, oh, there's a lot of evidence that it's possible that that plane was the actual one used in the filming of Casablanca, not in the scene where they're saying goodbye. Because that was a fake airplane that was made for just for that scene. A for kingdom. We're gonna talk about the Magic Kingdom's icon and look at the murals that are inside the castle. Underneath here tells the story using mosaic tiles of Cinderella. And one of my favorite ones is the concept that the Wicked Stepsisters are in on. So one is red and the other one on the left, green with envy or jealousy. Also, beware of the green eye monster. So these murals were designed by Dorothea Redmond and also Pond Sharp. And I was saying was thought about Pond Sharp. Now Pond Sharp, and also did the murals for the land pavilion in Epcot. Oh, yeah. And he also did the, mur the mosaics that are in the uh, transition strips for New Orleans Square in Disneyland. So if you look down, when you cross over into the shops at Disneyland, you can actually find mosaics by Hot Shark. He also used to do uh, tables that were there, but like, they don't exist anymore. L is for Liberty Bell, our working steam paddle boat over here. So this wasn't actually called the Liberty Bell to start with. It was called the Richard F. Irvine. And the, there was actually two of these steamships. The other one was called the Admiral Joe Fowler. Admiral Joe Fowler was the first one that was made, and it actually cracked in dry dock and um, they had to dismantle it. But they took the engine from it and put it, shipped it to Tokyo, and put it in Tokyo Disney, so that one lives on. But they were originally going to have this boat and also the sailing ship Columbia was going to be instead of a second uh, steamship. But they realized they needed more capacity and they needed rides with hover because of the Florida weather. So instead of having a second Columbia sailing ship, they just named Columbia Harbor House. There's a mural on the side of it. Like, Columbia. This little pirate bar that they have over here, but it's got a throwback. Not only does it have Pirates of the Caribbean uh, clothing, but if you look on the left-hand side, that's actually one of the, uh, the design of the Mike Fink keel boats that they had over here. And then that Mike Fink keel boat we talked about with the, the Pirates bar, this was the second landing spot for it things and probably one of the sweetest stories is right here on Main Street, M for Main Street, and that is going to be the Sharing We Magic statue that they have over here with Roy and Minnie. And the purpose of this, most people know the partner statue, which is all the way down in the hub with Mickey and Walt, but Roy was, and he's found also on this window over here, Roy was Walt's older brother, and when Walt had died, passed away, People kind of felt a little bit lost with the Disney company, and Roy was the one who made all of the Florida projects come true. And the day of commencement, Roy actually gave a speech right here where that bench is. Uh, and then after that speech, he left and sat at a bench at the Grand Floridian, because the story is that this was not his day. This was his brother Walt's day. Really sweet way to honor your brother. There's many windows on Main Street, and they are like screen credits to the Disney legends of people who built the Disney parks. One of my favorite windows is this one that's up here above you as well. And it, it says iWorks and iWorks, and it also has Up iWorks and Don iWorks. Now, Up iWorks was the one that helped basically invent Mickey Mouse alongside Beth Disney. He was an animator, and he was a prolific animator. He could do, he could do more work in a day than most animators could do it in a couple days. But Don Iwerks uh, is the one who actually was a hands of Lincoln when they changed his hands to make them more realistically sized. So 
Um, Abe Lincoln was in the show in 1964 World's Fair. Um, he was one of the first on England Jocks, but not the first, because that was the hero. But they had made him fans oversized. So when they made a version of him to bring to Disneyland for great moments with Mr. Lincoln, they had to recast hands, and they chose Don Iwerks for those hands. And so he likes to say, I've had my hands on Lincoln. See where the bar was? Years. <laughs> if he's married, I don't know how honest he is. <laughs> Letter N is going to be for noises, and this time we're going to talk about non-diegetic and diegetic noises, which is basically not only within attractions, but also the soundscaping that happens here in the parks. Uh, diegetic is when all the characters in the storyline can actually hear parts of uh, the narration, and then non-diegetic would mean that it's just in the background and they don't hear it. So non-diegetic, for example, would be at the Haunted Mansion, when the ghost host is narrating to us, but nobody else is paying attention or listening and responding to it. In the Jungle Cruise, something that's really fun is the original Jungle Cruise had several different types of sound. One is the sounds of the animals that is tripped by an infrared beam. So when the boats reach the infrared beam, it trips a sound for like the, the elephants trumpeting. But another one that they used was the overall general soundscape. The, it, they actually recorded sounds in Africa and they changed from daytime to nighttime from the actual sounds of Africa during the day and during the night. O is for obsolete and that's why we're standing here next to the Town Square Theater because this was actually had different plans for this building than what it is now. It was going to be a hotel and if you look up at the second story you'll see these were going to be individual apartments with their own balconies. But they ditched the idea of a hotel, probably because it would have been pretty hard to manage guests being in the park like this. And they turned it instead into the Gulf Hospitality House, which is another thing that is obsolete. So. And for mine, not only can we just see kind of like why this looks a lot like a lobby, like a hotel lobby uh, for the check-in section for Tony's, uh, but my obsolete will be inside, enhance, enhance. And that's gonna be Mr. Turd. Because Mr. Toad no longer exists here. My favorite attraction when I was a little kid. I love the fact that we had two tracks. But the your journey has been temporarily delayed for your safety. Because we broke down, problematic. To watch. So this uh, little ship, or it says Thirst Rangers on it, ship. Yeah, actually, a rehearsed problem with these light and on the energy can we still have the right TV? All they can show is three reasons. Yeah, I also have, I learned this from you, so I'm cheating, but whatever. This DVC stand over here used to be a ticket uh, counter, so you could actually purchase your E tickets or your A, B, C, D, E tickets from. So, Q for quarters, we're going to talk about things that cost less than a quarter even back then, or cost a quarter. And one of the things that I remember when I was a kid is we would go and we would go to the Main Street Penny Arcade, which closed in the late 90s, mid to late 90s, which had these mutoscopes, which the moving train gag. So can you, uh, Kate, can you flip this for me? Perfect. Railroad, and um, you see that Walt Disney's name is actually up on the window there. They named Walt Disney World Walt Disney World and not Disney World because of his um, boy Disney. He, everybody said to him, people are just going to shorten it to Disney World, so why in the world would we do that? He's like, no, I want everybody to know that this was my brother's park, this was his street, so we have to say Walt Disney World. And so that's why you always see Walt Disney World. You never just see Disney World on any official Disney things. Now, this uh, railroad behind us actually has four trains. One is named after Walt Disney. We also have one for his wife, Lillian. And then we have uh, Roger E. Broby, who was the one that helped manufacture the original trains for Disneyland. And then uh, Roy O. Disney, of course, his brother, who made this park possible after his brother passed away. S is for Space Mountain. And my favorite fact is... On the inside, they project all these stars and comets and things floating around in space. 
Uh, but this iconic shape with the supports on the outside was not the original look. The original look, it was supposed to be smooth on the outside, but to do the projectors, you can't have supports on the inside because the projections would not be fluid as they went across the outside of the structure. So instead, we get the most iconic or one of the most iconic building shapes because they had to put the structural supports on the outside to be able to create a smooth projection experience on the inside. Okay, so there's a couple of secrets here at the end of Space Mount. If you look in this panel here, we do have the top. And those have the real to Rose Waves in Port in Central Florida. So A1A is the crowd that runs on the coast. So the I, or of course, the first year seeing board. Yeah, I like it says heavy congestion. Yes, it does. Um, 182 means US 182, the main road of the city. Yep. Along at the bottom border of Walt Disney World, Crown C50 could refer to Colonial State Road 15 that cuts through Orlando. And International is a reference to International Drive. VSTA is for one of this. Vista, yeah. It's like to something like Visibility Eye. Mm hmm. There's also uh, open sectors and closed sectors. So closed sectors are attractions that have been uh, permanently like, split almost from the Magic Kingdom. Or oh, 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 we had or uh, Fantasy Land, two that will be 20 thousand miles over the sea. Oh, right. Fantasy oh, Land, Skyway to Fantasy Land, Main Street USA, Swan Boots, Fantasy Land, Mickey Mouse Review, and Toronto Land, Mission to Mars. And then we have the open sectors. These old nobles, rides that have been added to the Magic Kingdom, the Jin Dude, Fantasyland, many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, Adventureland, Aladdin's Wine Carpets, Fantasyland, Mickey's Still Our Magic, Frontierland, Splash Mouth, Carland, Buzz Lightyear, Space Ranger Spin, and Tomorrowland, Monsters, Ape, and Gelato. And then over here in the underwater section, talks about 20,000 light years under the sea, which is a reference, of course, of. 20,000 leaves on the sea. Hang on, it's got a floater through. There we go. For tea, we're going to do Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And guess what? We're going to be, we're, there's going to be a lot of little little fun ones in here. Amy Baxter, who's up here as Barnabas T. Bullion, who's the proprietor and owner of the Big Thunder Mountain Company. If you are a Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room fan, another tea in up here at the top is uh, Rosita's cage. So whatever happened to Rosita? Well, we don't really know. Oh, she's actually over at Disneyland, so we do know. Never mind. But there's her empty cage here. All of these machines are called Auto Canary machines, and they're basically going to regulate and make sure there's no noxious fumes. All the way at the end here uh, is Canary Seed, and this is all in reference, and that's the reason why there's bird cages to the canary in the coal mine where miners would bring down a bird and if the bird died from fumes that they couldn't smell whatever it was always like odorless uh it would give them basically the notice to get out of the the mine so if you ever heard that term canary in the coal mine it comes from how miners would protect themselves all right i'm just said like there's so many and we couldn't go into this section of the queue but one of the mines is called the tommy knocker section and tommy knockers were like these little dwarves that would hide and play tricks on the miners, like take their food, which in retrospect, it was probably just somebody taking their food. But I like that they blamed it on things called Tommy knockers. All the big thunder mountains had their own unique reason for why they're thunderous, so to speak. So Disneyland used to be earthquakes that would happen that would make it so that you have that final lift hill, then things would start falling on you. It's since changed and now it's more of a story about explosives. And we do see some of that storytelling here in the queue of uh, the Disney World version. But the Disney World's reason why there's eruption in the mine is actually geysers. So you can see them. Can you give me a geyser point? Geyser. <laughs> little wilderness humor. So you can see them really pretty right here. Like, like Yellowstone, um, there, there are geysers that do, not right now, but there's geysers that do shoot off and that you see it also like Mammoth Hot Springs at the end of this ride, like you see in Yellowstone. That's another good example. And that's, and that's why you're going to see the camera. It teeter-totters us at the very last one, and that's supposed to be the geysers uh, going off, and that's what's making us shoot out of the mine like it is. Yeah. 
Well, it's you, so let's go under the sea with Ariel. And, uh, but we're, before we even go out there, this used to be over where Ariel's Grotto was. So for Ariel's Grotto, they used to have this Poseidon slash Triton. Uh, and then also our buddy, Harper Goff, who designed 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, so at New Fantasyland, replaced with Ariel 20,000 Leagues in Seven Doors Mine Train. Harper Goff does get H Goff cartography and a nice little steampunk on the top for the style that the Nautilus was built in. Uh, and the waters here uh, actually contain some volumes of the water from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So they Me love rocks. There's no doubt about it. We love rocks. We love rocks. We love crates. This is because there's so many little kin secrets that the Imagineers have put in. Bronx and crates and barrels and all kinds of things for you to find. And one of my favorites is one that Kirk actually showed me, which is over here at the end of Ariel. You can see an abstract sequel literally in the yeah so like this would be his hat there's his face there's the wheel right and so see what william ford was the first mickey mouse cartoon which synchronized that not the first mickey mouse cartoon because that was the late pre and that that was the first thing you think this is like really the one that gave you the play to the claim v is for voiceover you have to talk about one of the most important ones to the haunted mansion which is paul freeze which you would know him as the ghost host now paul freeze did all kinds of voiceovers for his voice actor for disney and worked on all kinds of projects um he was the auctioneer in pirates of the caribbean and he also narrated adventures through inner space um he also did other work outside of disney like uh he was boris badenov for the rocky and bull evil show and you might also know him as professor ludwig von drake all voiced by Paul Freed. But Jack Wagner over at the original monorail recording. But for Worm and Tango and say, Ali Hadros, say, let's wear us. Yeah, stay clear of the doors, kids. W for Winnie the Pooh. We're in the home of a house of Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Behind me is a hidden Mickey, which is always great. And uh, Kate's going to tell you, hang on. Hey, hang on. There you go. Bro, we also have over here is the Nautilus. We just, we talked about the Nautilus being in the queue for Ariel. This is another little nod to it. It's actually based on the 1968 Disney feature at Winnie the Pooh and the Blustery Day. Now the the name Winnie the Pooh, um, of course comes from a, a new fought in World War One and I had a whole bunch of PTSD or shell shock. Then he moved to the country. And then in 1923, he wrote a poem called Teddy Bear, which mentions a mystery with Edward Berry, super helpful by Christopher Robin, after the to London Zoo, Christopher Robin was his son, where a black bear was rescued, rescued from Winnipeg, which is Winnie, of course, they have solved there. So Mill's 1924 poetry book, When We Were Very Young, um, the author tells his son, uh, explaining about how he would feed a swan in the morning, but the bird wouldn't come. The boy would say poo to show how little you wanted them. So then he wrote a poem in uh, Christmas Eve of 1925 that was featured in the London Evening News, an AML short story, The Wrong Sword of Bees, is the very first mention of Winnie the Pooh all strung together. The newly renamed bear is dragged down the stairs by Christopher Robin, bumping his head all the way down. Chris Robin asks father to make up a tale about Pooh and the yarn he spins established Pooh as the world does him today. So that's how we got the other name Winnie the Pooh. Does next know. is her ex Atencio, who is um, an animator first and then Imagineer. He actually works as an in-betweener on Pinocchio. That's where he thought he'd start with Disney. And then he does the stop motion animation for Mary Poppins, among many other projects. Um, then he also worked on the dinosaurs for Ford's Magic Skyway. And, but I like to uh, think of him as the script writer for The Haunted Mansion. And one of the things that he gave us was the song Grim Grinning Ghost. Although that wasn't its original name because before that it was, it had an alternative name as the Screaming Song, but his first draft of the song was actually called the Kook Spookin' Song. And it would, the chorus went, we'll spook you kooks right out of your skin. It's <laughs> a ridiculous name. Uh, and then I like him also because uh, before he wrote uh, Grim Grim, came off with Pirate's Life for me. Uh, so, and that honestly was just a conversation at uh, the Walt Disney Company that basically was when, hey, I have an idea for that pirate attraction. And 
okay, give it a go. And it worked out really well. And also he voiced Fritz, which is one of the birds from Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. And that's Max Defensio. Y is for yards, and the most notable yard is this bad boy with the castle in the background with its artificial turf, which was installed uh, by Astroscapes, but the turf itself is this stuff called Easy Turf. It's synthetic, it's permeable, it can drain well, and it's made out of polyethylene. And it apparently can last up to 15 to 20 years, which... We're talking about landscaping in the Magic Kingdom. There was not much here when they first were going to build it. It was literally a swamp, and Walt Disney was so excited that people considered it a place where people, nobody could rebuild. That's what the land we're sitting on right now is. So there are areas of this park and of um, all of Walt Disney World that they actually physically can't build. There's sinkholes, there's places where they've tried to put pylons in and they've gone down 20 feet or more and they just disappear. So there are unbuiltable parts of Walt Disney World. But when they first got here, because it was just swampland, it was literally like, it was swamp, it was cypress trees, and it was a ton of armadillos. So they had to create all of this landscaping pretty much from scratch. But Bill Evans was in charge like he was in Disneyland. And in Disneyland, if you remember, they had to hunt for all of the trees for Disneyland. They got some from the Santa Ana Freeway. They got some from people's yards. They offered them money for their plants. They had to hunt and pick for their trees. Well, they knew this project was coming. Bill Evans is like, I'm going to be prepared. So a year before Disneyland, Disney World was actually instructed, he built a nursery on property and started collecting and growing all of the plants that they needed. So as they finished an attraction, they went and they put the plants in the attraction so that it was um, all ready to go just as they finished the attraction and it was well landscaped. So we didn't have, like we had in Disneyland where everything was so unfinished when Disneyland opened in terms of landscaping, that didn't happen here at Disney World. They actually were very well prepared. Z is for Ziploc and over here as well as Splashbound and really it, it happened in 2019 after the retheme of the Zippity Doodah uh, merchandise stand, they started giving out Ziploc bags but they also started giving them out here as well. The ones here are actually really fun. They still give them out and they're called like safari snack bags and there's lots of little fun hidden jokes on there as well. Ziploc as a company actually didn't start until 1968 and this ride is set in 1938. So the timeline doesn't quite match up. Thank you so much for hanging out with Kate and myself. Kirk from walruscarp.com, your spot for the latest hack snacks and fun facts and of course, Theme park clothing that doesn't stink. And with me as always, Kate, the Disney Cicerone. You can follow me for obscure Disney history with a dash of encouragement um, at, at Disney Cicerone or DisneyCicerone.com. I also have a book called A Glimpse of the Magic, Finding Ourselves in the Disney Story that's available on Amazon and, and also as a- Wanna join us? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where to start now. I'm so, I'm so tired.